Hey everyone, um, I'm Jason. And uh, before I talk about myself, I'd like to know about all of you who cares Scrum Master or some type of project. Great. Uh, any developers? Nice. Um, any other disciplines, product, BI, uh, BA? Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so basically, uh, who, why am I here? Uh, I'm here just because I've been going to Camo for quite a long time, back in the days when we used to go out of like uh, the University of Calgary and ICT buildings and like comp side. That was pretty fun. It was like a nice small room. Um, and I'm actually here just to continue to give back to the community. Uh, thanks, Brock, for reaching out to me. Uh, I've been meaning to do another talk. I just couldn't really think of one to do. And just thankfully, this topic was just at top of mind. So um, I'm a software development leader. My current role right now is a VP of engineering over at a startup called PayShepherd. Um, we do vendor relationship management. Um, we're right now about 50 people looking to scale. And what led me into software leadership is basically I went through, as probably a few of you have done, uh, an agile transition. I think my first one was back in 2008. And I was like, wow, this is pretty impressive. Like I was used to the waterfall way of doing things, right? And I really uh, like the agile values and practices and being this cohesive, um, just like cross-functional team. And I, I understood like, hey, as a lead developer, um, I actually could have more impact to the teams and my, my coworkers and my organization if I turned into management. And I wanted to be the type of manager that I could have used to grow in my career. And on top of that, more importantly, the type of manager that my teams would be able to benefit from. So in general, I just really wanted to help the teams. And recently, uh, in the past three years, I've been looking into product, like product management as something my goal. Um, not really interested in turning into a product manager, but more like getting to know more about it because as I started to exercise uh, lean and uh, and lean principles throughout the entire value stream, I started to take a look downstream all the effects of software development and how we make things a little bit smoother, getting up to prod and operations, looking upstream at all the requirements and making sure that we have those tech feedback loops. So then I really dug into uh, product when I started to be responsible for a number of the product owners um, in one of my books. So that's a little bit about me. Oh, great book forward. Yes. You can go to the other screen to get okay about ah. the screen. And yep. Yeah. Okay. And so hit the yeah, yeah the, okay ah, the acknowledgments. And the X on there just so they're out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So first uh, let's talk about software delivery. What does that mean to all of you? Anyone, like, what's the broad, what does this term mean to you? I can tell you what it means to me, but anyone, feel free to throw it out there. What software does it mean? Um, so for me, software delivery means that you are ensuring that your team is working on one value. They are delivering value. Mm -hmm. They are not delivering parts of the code. They are not delivering features. They are delivering value. So this means that you need to ensure they they, you need to keep them on track and you need to always talk with your product owners to ensure that they know that this is the value and not to let them work on things that are around there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's okay. what the software okay. delivery means for me. <laughs> Perfect. Um we will be touching on that. Anyone else? Uh build the right thing and build the thing right. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Make your changes so that people can Okay, great, awesome. I will say triple D approach, uh, design, development, and the deployment of uh, impactful solutions mm -hmm. which have business need of organization. Great. Uh, my answer encompasses a lot of them. My definition of delivery is anything throughout the entire value stream and all the activities that produce value. For example, inception of an idea, implementation, release, going out to prod, being in prod, maintaining that. So that to me is software. So let's uh, let's hear from the group again. What delivery metrics are you familiar with in your space, whether it's like the agility, whether it's um, you know development, et cetera? Anyone? Does it work? 
Sorry. Those are the doors. Oh, great. Door. Can you please enlighten us as to a couple of the door metrics? Door metrics, like how, what's your section? Like how fast you can, how long is your uptime, or how fast you recover? What is your speed to delivery? Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, you hit on, uh, was that four or three? Uh, yeah, you're right. That, uh, for anyone uh, not familiar with the work, um, research assessment, I believe, and that's what it stands for. So it is a mean time to recovery from failure, change failure rate, how many times you release a key, introduce defects or failing the rod, um, lead time, and something else that I'm forgetting. I'm cheating now. Deployment frequency, that's a big one. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Come on, screen masters, you know this. Yes. So probably, uh, I think we need to look at each each leg of the process, and each each leg has its own KPIs. Mm -hmm. So you have in development, right? You have the velocity of the team. You have the uh, defects. Um, mm -hmm. Then you go to the point, right? Because your door comes in, and then you need to actually create your own metrics for the customer, right? Like how are they using this product? Perfect. Yeah. So. Okay. Do you want? That's the rest of my talk. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's okay. okay. Use my slides if you want. <laughs> cool. Um, you're absolutely correct. Velocity, of course, story pointing, right? All of you are familiar with burn down. How are we tracking against our sprint? Plan versus deliver overall. Uh, code coverage for anyone in the development world, right? Um, again, the door metrics are here, deployment frequency, MTPR, lead time for changes and change failure rate. The one by far most influential is deployment frequency, by the way. So, um, by the way, for the uh, DevOps research and assessment, I believe that was founded by Nicole Forsgen, Forsgen and Jean Kim. There's a really good book called Accelerate about this, and it's a book on all of the research that was done. So, here's my assertion. My assert oh, yes, please. Change failure rate. The what's sorry? The last one. Uh, change failure rate. When you release something to prod, uh, is it breaking? Is it failing? Does it introduce defects to prod? So when you introduce a change to prod, is something failing? So yeah. Is it not successful? Um, it could be potentially successful, but then you might have the hot. Well, might be partially successful, but you still need a hot fix, right? It's not full downtime. Okay, so my assertion is delivery metrics are not enough. And exactly to your point, um, what's the value out of what you're delivering, right? So delivery metrics are how we're delivering, not the impact of what we're delivering. What do y'all think about that? Okay, cool. I see a couple of nods. Hopefully it's not just because you're a okay. <laughs> So how many of you can resonate with this? This is from a book called Product Leadership by Banfield Erickson and Walking Shop. Because we have been so focused on engineering delivery, success metrics have been based on the output of simply shipping an experience to a customer. It's time to go beyond the input and think deeply about measuring the outcome, right? So we're thinking about just getting something off the product. Okay, cool. What next, right? Just Are we just a feature factor, just shipping stuff without understanding, right? Here's another one. Oh, this one's from Mark Schwartz in his book, The Art of Business Value. Here we go, value. IT can deliver on requirements it is given with exquisite execution and still not be delivering business value. Have any of you made a feature that was not used? Sure. Um, we, we had at some point across the board that was uh, probably not very technical in nature. <clears throat> and he wanted to have code coverage and he asked 100% code coverage. <laughs> so that's not value. <laughs> that's yep. just exquisite execution. <laughs> and you can also fudge those numbers too, so. I can give another example. Sure. Uh, so one of the teams that I've been working with for the past couple of years, uh, ship software that is primarily consumed by one major client. And uh, recently, um, the, our, our UX designer 
ran a survey with staff at that client. And the feedback that came back was, to put it mildly, searing. Like, Ooh, they were not pleased. It was very harsh. And uh, and I think it was a really eye-opening experience because, because the team is staffed with nothing but really smart, competent people mm-hmm. that have invested their heart and soul in building really great product. And, and yet... And yet we have this product that customers, frankly, are not happy with. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting dynamics around there. But just to your point, the execution is some of the best in the company. And the business value for the survey, it's not there. Well, there you go. That's an interesting counter example to when you think you have, well, you have smart people delivering on good ideas. That's right. Exactly. So... I think of value in the context of business, like meeting your business strategy and the objective, but not only for your business. It's about who's using the system and your users aren't always the customers that buy the software, right? Um, So the people that are using the system, well, what are you offering to them? Are you offering them uh, something that they can do that they couldn't do before, uh, enabling them in some sort of way? Or are you saving them some time? Like this is all different measures of value for that, right? So, um, geez, what was that count? One thing. There, there's so many uh, funny examples of this, but when you ask people, like uh, one of the former companies I used to work for, it was like for automating, um, what was it? Automating security, uh, inf- information security compliance. And when you ask people, okay, well, what's your biggest competitor? You can name like the other companies that you're against. And people often forget about Excel, right? This is a manual thing. Everyone's baked into it. Everyone knows it, it's the default thing. You have market penetration of these competitors and you have a bunch of your people who can manage work in Excel, right? So are you offering something different from what they're used to? So again, uh, back to what value is your software providing? Um, in the last feature that you shipped, what value did it bring to your business? More importantly, what value did it bring to your customer and its users, right? Now, interestingly enough, okay, we're talking about value. And you say, yeah, they brought some value. Okay, how do you know? Anyone? What's your key indicators that it value is unique? Anyone? Feedback. Yeah. Cool. How do you get feedback? What are you doing? I'm the person. Oh, good. Yeah. Then? I just said a challenge. And that most people who use social media not have <laughs> <laughs> They are. It's a boring Is it a number of users? Oh, the, 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 now, now we're jumping ahead. But yes. Yeah. Use his statistic of creating more of uh, print products. Nice. We shall get the first people in the There you go. So these are all. Good feedback loops, yes? Uh, maybe smart goals, something specific and yeah. comfortable. Nice. Uh, really, good, uh, really good suggestions. Now, uh, I have an alternative. So why is this important? If you're not delivering the value that you, that you expected, either A, you're not getting the feedback loops correct, or you may even need to pivot in the direction that you went based on the feedback that you're getting. For example, the company that uh, you were talking about, right? Was that, is it the UX? Are we actually completely missing the mark? How do you correct course, right? So, um, talking about the value that your software is providing. For me, when I was an engineer uh, or a software developer, I was like, I took it for granted. It's like, yeah, the product people got it, right? Like, just tell me, give me the requirements, we'll build it. Um, in in the Scrum world, we kind of defer it a little bit. I, to be honest, I haven't gone through any product owner training, but we kind of like defer it to the product owner, the product manager. It's like, yeah, just this concept of value, you know, that we should deliver from, right? But it's still ambiguous. So what I'm saying is valuable is when your software isn't prod, is it being used properly in the way that you expect? Is it delivering the outcome and the impact that your business hypotheses had made, right? Um, more importantly, are people accomplishing what they wanted to with your software? So, um, let's see. Ah, I came up with this funny thing earlier today. How, can someone please share an example of 
a feature in software or an app that you used recently and not found it valuable at all. I was literally on LinkedIn this morning, posting a job, and I was like, create your job description with AI. And I'm like, that's a need, but why would I want LinkedIn to generate a job description for me when I have one ready to go? And on top of that, all I gave it was senior software. Like, it's not tailored to my needs, right? So yeah, it's, it's flashy, it's neat, but I'm, I'm curious as to how much that should be used or if people are getting something out of it, right? So, and also to me, I think I might have mentioned this uh, at the risk of repeating myself, like customer value, right? Can they do something that they couldn't look at? Are they actually using it? Have you simplified something for them? Have you made a friction list pretty easy? Did you save them some time, right? So, now that we've talked a little bit about value, how do you measure um, value? And we use metrics typically to, to measure that sort of thing, right? I came across this one uh, framework called Goals, Signals, and Metrics. And we'll dive into the first is the goal. It's typically what do you want to achieve? And the goal is primarily based on something that you either want to maximize or minimize. You want to either trend up or down, right? Um, some examples here are like, uh, I put it on here, error rates, viewing time. Think of streaming services, not things, right? They want to maximize viewing time. They want to maximize the amount of repeat viewing time. Um, all of you can probably, like, uh, what do you call this, uh, resonate with this, maximizing productivity. How many of you have chat used chat GPT in the past week? Anyone to help you out? There you go, like it helps you, right? It's a name one. Uh, like, maybe, maybe it goes for this other one, minimize effort, <laughs> right? So there you go. So. When you think about the goal, my goal is to, for example, I'm going to use the example of Netflix because I'm sure that someone here has used Netflix. Hopefully. <laughs> um, we want to be able to maximize the viewing time and then therefore exposure to our customers. The signal in this particular framework is what is the thing that we want to track that will give us an idea of what the value is, right? And so in our example, we want to maximize viewing time. Well, let's take a look at minutes viewed. We're not going to count the seconds. We're not going to count hours. We're not going to count the actual shows or the actual movies. We're going to count minutes, right? I think YouTube even has this own threshold. Like you have to watch a YouTube video over X number of seconds for it to count as a view. But anyways, that's a, that's on side. So our signal is the minutes view, and so our metric is just going to be something that we can track over time or a comparative value. If you focus on a raw count. It's just something that might be aggregated over time. It doesn't really give you much to compare, let's say, over time. Right? So typically, metrics are uh, a percentage or you know, something over time. Now, there's a few example metrics that I pulled from the web. Um, we've got Airbnb, you know, nights booked. Uh, that's value for both people that are renting and people who are looking for a place to stay. When they maximize the number of nights booked, these people have Renting out have lower vacancies, and the people that need to place place to stay are able to stay. Um, you can see a couple of streaming services here, like Spotify. Um, okay, maybe that's the only one. Uh, we've got Uber, number of trips, right? Again, platform. We've got our users who need to get somewhere. We have our drivers who want to earn some income by providing a service. Links these two people. If you maximize the number of trips then all, a lot of your drivers are engaged and your customers need to, that are able to get some. So here's just a few examples that I want to share. Now, back to a different framework called Heart. Now, this is the alternative to Smart, but it might um, there might be some overlap. So Heart is uh, a framework, and as you can see here, it's happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, task success. It was originally developed by Google, uh, as a UX framework. And incidentally, or maybe not, because it's based on user experience, it lends its well, it's itself well to product. And when we look at these, this is interesting because it captures a lot of different aspects. So let's dig into happiness, okay? Um, what is a measure of happiness? Well, how delighted are your customers? Some people, uh, I think we, yeah, but we ask them, right? Uh, some of you can probably relate to this. How many of you have gone a survey in the past month? 
about, hey, how are you satisfied with your service? Like from zero to 10, right? Anyone familiar with NPS? So for those of you not familiar, NPS is a very common way to get a happiness metric. It's called the Net Promoter Score. Basically, anyone uh, in a survey scoring nine or 10, they likely had a very positive experience and will very likely recommend their service to uh, someone in need or even just like promote it uh, without you asking, right? We've got some detractors, uh, not detractors, some uh, passives in the middle there, S7 and 8. Uh, they're the people that are like, you know, they'll, they'll still rate you decent, but they're not going to build your brand or tear it down. It's just like they're a user. Um, and anything six and below are considered detractors. So people that are just like, yeah, they kind of see flaws in the system and maybe they'll start talking about it and potentially erode from your brand, right? So NPS is the net promoter score, the percentage of your um, promoters minus the percentage of your detractors and that your NPS positive is good, negative, probably not so good. You gotta do something um, to help improve the image of your product or your, your experience. Um, stuff that you might relate to, app store rating, I don't know, Yelp, Google reviews, right? Uh, recommendations to friends, how many of you have shared something in social media? Like, you know, I'm a promoter of this because it's funny, cat videos, whatever your thing is, right? So yeah, that, like you're, pro you're actively promoting it because you enjoy it. Uh, the E is for engagement. And this basically means, hey, how many people are actively using your software um, at a particular point in time? And for some reason, Google Slides is not liking this, so you're gonna be see my slides jump around a little bit. Okay, so how many people are actively using your software? We're talking about, uh, for example, streaming services like Netflix, average viewing time. Are you gonna do this per day, per week, per month? Um, for certain services like, I don't know, maybe some people use Uber every day, maybe it's gonna be more of a week, monthly type thing, uh, depending on what, how you're measuring and how frequent your customers are actually engaging. Adoption. Adoption is fairly simple. Have people started using your product, software, or service, right? Um, some examples of this are app downloads per month if someone has installed something. More, a better signal would actually be if someone started using it. Did they start that workflow? Did they register as a user in the system so that they could start something? It's something that I, I don't know, I've downloaded a few apps on it that I ever, actually never used, right? So if someone had registered and started a workflow, that is an indicator that someone has adopted or started using your system. So this is the adoption. And retention. Um, basically, are customers repeating business? And this one, um, a lot of businesses really look at uh, what they call um, customer churn, whether it's a, uh, if you're a SaaS company, typically on an annual basis. Some people are returning customers based on a service on a weekly or monthly basis, like, you know, subscriptions, that type of stuff. Um, average customer lifetime, right? Basically, it is a percentage of returning customers or the number of transactions. I don't know, like, maybe there's the Amazon subscription that you're subscribed to for recurring orders, et cetera, or the, the monthly subscription to a particular streaming service. And I'm going to show my hand here, but basically, like, my personal favorite is task success. Are people accomplishing what they needed to do by adopting your software, by using your software? In my opinion, this is a really, really important question. So, oh, yeah, I just, I guess I said it was slide. So when you think about um, for Uber or any ride share, did people book that ride share? Did they get to the place that they needed to go? When you think about ordering a pizza, did, I, did they actually get that pizza? Is it the right pizza? <laughs> Um, did it get it on time? Is it satisfactory? Um, when you think of a user using your system, uh, how much time does it take to complete that workflow or objective? Did they complete that objective? So a little bit, I know it's still a little bit abstract. So, hey, why don't we do an activity? Oh, look, there's post-it notes here. What a coincidence, bro. Thank you. Um, what I would all, uh, I would love all of you to do is break up into, I don't know, groups of four or five. And hey, look, we launched an online pizza shop. Come up with metrics on how we would track each of these. And if you need help with some of the definitions, feel free to come up to me. Feel free to ask the people that you're with. 
with our pizza shop, how would you track customer happiness, the engagement with our app? Um, let's say it's an app and a web and a web presence, um, the adoption, retention, task success. Um, how much time do we have? Or like, how much time should we give? Like eight minutes? Are we going to still be good for that? Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, let's do like five to eight minutes. Everyone, please get get stretching. Yeah. Yeah. Who needs one more minute? Are we good to go? All right. You can keep going. We'll we'll, we'll hear from everyone. The first one's a little bit of a give place. Who chose something other than PS for Good. Kick us off. Um, well, so not in PS drafting, we mentioned uh, reviews. Great. So you can have any such things that are sent by guys to but then also like, comments and social Nice. Also Basically, like your I found out of like low reviews and comments. Like, yeah, comments, great. Perfect. Um, back in the room. Refer nice, good one. Referrals. Perfect. Perfect. Um, by the referrals, how are you gonna track? Just like, you know, how did you hear by us? That type of survey with some onboards? That is great. Coupon code. I thought of a. Uh, oh, I'm not going to give away the next one. Maybe. Yeah. Anyone here? Happiness. We besides NPS, we had uh, two items that are not really metrics. Uh, one was good UX, and <laughs> one was auto apply eligible discounts. The idea that if someone basically without if someone's ordering a pizza and the system somehow detects that they are eligible for a discount, maybe it's their first time ordering, maybe they've ordered more than some threshold number in, in, a, in a time period, then they then the system, if the system calculates that, then it just auto applies the discount rather than, rather, rather than forcing the user to be aware right. that they're eligible and then find their own code and then data enter it, it just makes it easier for them. So it's more a technique to yeah. drive NPS rather than a measure. Thing itself. I mean, you could count the number of auto applied eligible discounts. Right. Yeah. Um, if they're a first time user, I believe that's a way to drive conversion, how to convert them into an actual paid user versus like just a spend. Yeah. So nice. Um, yeah. If you wanted that piece of you go, ah, this is delicious. It's only $5. And then it comes up to 15 You're going to be unhappy because mm. you don't understand the first time user discount was applied to the first time user. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to Yeah. So uh, another interesting thing to track over time is, hey, how many people get over that first time use into the second and third? And then, of course, the following. I guess that goes with attention. Um, engagement. Anyone want to share? Increasing the size of orders over time. Okay. And then uh, we grew to think they're all still buying 10. Likely what's going on is it's an income where it's like buying. I I kind of classify that as retention, but I see where you're going with this. Yep, mm -hmm. good. Thank you. It was confusing. And oh, okay. Depending on whether there's like seating, like the percentage mm -hmm. of seats that are filled per hour per day, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, reservations, if that's a problem. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So for me, um, to clarify between retention and engagement, for me, if I was if I was the only pizza shop in Calgary with this, uh, I guess I'm kind of leading on, but um, how many number of pizzas are ordered per day would be something I would try, for example. Um, I see a hand up down here. Yeah, I was, I'm thinking about my page now, it's tenfold under the FX channel. Oh, tips. Yeah. Dude. Nice. Dude. That's an interesting one. I think. Cool. Um, anyone else for engagement? Yep. Is it not just sales? You know, overall sales. Yeah. You can certainly track that. Oh. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, like the type or like the type of pizza that's being ordered. Yeah. So, engagement, like, for example, the promo or the specific one that you rolled out. 
Yeah. Number of hits uh, on your website uh, per day or particular matrix right. per hour per day. Yeah. Irrespective of sales, that's any feature where you are engaged with. How are you totally engaged with the customers? Are you taking sales or not? That's the first thing. Are you getting that from hits which you know about the break you have I would say, considering your city or your local country populations. So, in the online business, I would measure that. Is that my issue? Interesting. Um, one thing that product books do talk about is vanity metrics. And like, if people are like, oh yeah, we have a ton of views on a page, that might be a little bit misleading. But if you can somehow tie it to how many of those views turn into conversions into a sale, that might be a little bit uh, more meaningful. That's what I kind of had was like going to the whole flow. Yeah. Perfect. Still still dropping. That's right. Page. They call that the funnel. Yeah. Um, the top of the funnel, a lot of people are in. How many people actually reach the end and convert? Perfect. Um, yep. Yeah. So I will consider the number of feedback I am getting. Uh, as a so far, how much feedback I am getting, that also reflect kind of which of my customers was in with my business. So, kind of feedback I'm getting. Okay. On maybe the platform or the or just a community page, or as a just a review. Right, got it. So, so the the quantity and quality of feedback, uh, that also opens the door to a lot of things. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of things you can measure, but what's going to be the most meaningful for your organization is going to depend on what you're aiming for, right? So, um, adoption. Anyone uh, have any interesting adoption metrics you want to share? Yeah. Yeah. Like the number of users registered that actually made orders. Yeah. When people who started order versus when they had presented and when they used it. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing counts. Are you going to measure this against what or against what period of time? Depends. Yep. We had a new customer like how many new customers per week? There you go, customers per week. And like you said, you know, um, uh, conversion per week or something like that. We want to be able to display this either as a ratio of something or over time. So this is what I'm kind of kind of nudging uh, when you're when you're thinking of the right idea for the signal. How are we going to turn this into a metric, right? Yeah. Yes. Instances like most of those are brand new people every week. That means they run a lot of repeats. Um, yes, so uh, that uh, that would be like adoption and engagement and retention are kind of all tied together. Adoption of the first time, engagement is how many people at a particular period of time, retention is human, how much repeat is coming back for that particular individual you know, customer segment. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's what, what I should request. Well, we talked about um, yep. in the folder, and so how many new code users come per week? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Or maybe um, with one of your promos to divide segments up, you have a different promo code, right? Um, so that's how we can do some uh, type of marketing uh, analytics on that. Um, task success, anyone with suggestions? Oh, sorry, attention, we see it. Maybe just for um, metrics for between people that are coming in and buying the pizza right? the ones that are ordering online. Oh, right. Right. So, good point. Good point. Okay. Um, anything like retention? Okay. Within what time frame? Uh, what about um think about your own situation how much time how many of you get takeout or order out um how often do you order does it does that time frame make sense to you i think a month would be a good uh, month yeah. i was thinking even maybe three months yeah. 
Okay. Um, because I know I, I would teach a lady once every couple months. Who knows, right? Yeah. In the pet food world, is for the first time you get three purchases. Right. So like the time you you make your first purchase. Mm -hmm. it's it's required. What about the op opposite of that? How about the percentage of people not repeating business within a certain time frame? Mm -hmm. So it's not just a positive signal. Why aren't these people becoming repeat customers? Can we dig into that? Can we get feedback on that? Um, I know that we're uh, running a little bit over, but let's uh, talk about task success. Anyone with task success measures? Yeah. I was thinking about like if it's a big event, Super Bowl, and then you have a lot of models. Oh, yeah. Uh, that could be an anomaly, but I mean, you want you might measure that year over year or compare it to specific like so they, other events. They, 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 they might order a Yeah. You might have to normalize over yeah. similar events. Yeah. And then how do we match? Yeah. Is that valid? I would say it's it's valid, but you want to separate some sort of anomaly or separate event to, to compare apples to apples, and then that would give you an idea of how to distribute your goods in uh, in that particular time frame or during a peak period. Yep. Uh, question: Like, um, I'm imagining a pizza shop that is five minutes walk from the store. Mm -hmm. If you sell pizzas, mm -hmm. you can imagine a metric that is the percentage. Uh, like walk-ins versus mm -hmm. uh, ordering whole wheat pizzas. Mm -hmm. Number of pizzas sold per day, but number of slices. And, yep. Oh, interesting. Yeah, number of slices per day because there might be some of these walk-ins with just like small groups. Yeah, okay. like students. Right. Just coming to lunch and they might be coming every day. Would that be, what type of uh, metric that would be? Would that be an engagement one in terms of like the type of product that you're selling? I think it might be a lunch. Like that is your go to lunch. Interesting. Uh, can you walk into an online? That, that was, I was going to focus on the online part of it, oh, but yeah. perhaps like there has to be some place that makes it. So that is a valid point. Want to explore those borders like when you compare the online border versus the online? There you go. And that's how you segment. Those particular analytics. Yeah, there's a lot of ways you can you can carve this up. It, it's uh what what's most meaningful for your business. Um, I do want to jump into task success because I really like the thought of this one. Anyone uh, with their measure of task success that you want? To... So as a measure that was already mentioned, uh, you called it the funnel. We are calling it the pizza ordering workflow. Yep. And the idea is uh, if you complete the workflow, you are successful. If you abandon at any point before mm -hmm. that, you are unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So it counts over time period and probably choose a set of consistent time periods. So if sure. you're counting yep. everything per day, count it per day. Yep. But whatever the time period is. Cool. Good. So task success uh, depends on each business creation. What for me, I would. As a matrix for task success, uh, so we have a five other uh, parameters to track. Mm -hmm. If I'm succeeding on every for that five above seventy percent, that's my break even point. I would say if I'm uh, crossing seventy percent average feedback for forever, so I'm maybe considering that as a success. Success for me with the task. Okay. The the crossing the seventy percent of the well, for example, I have received 100 feedback on mm -hmm. that uh, third, 70 feedbacks are positive. So my one of the tasks uh, get, you know, free food uh, with the 70%. For the retentions, everything is uh, on the average come above 70%, then I will consider that task as a success. But again, it depends on individual business uh, benchmark, what sort of benchmark they set for their business. Consider it as a task. I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, for a sustainable business, for them, it's 60 percent is very good. From a very competitive business, for them, 90 percent is task. Right. So for us, because we just launched, our definition of task success would be a bit different, right? Um, I think I saw some hands here. Yeah. 
So for me, I would focus on uh, the, the completeness of the work mm -hmm. because that would throw questions around the reliability of my system, like down channels. Basically, are we experiencing like a broken uh, process, yep. a broken system that causes customers trying to make payments? And if they're not just to do it, then they are abandoned. Process. So that would throw up a lot of end issues. So we using the right separate systems are we getting the right support from our teams to come back to the software we yeah. okay. how many of how many visitors to get into that hundred people came in and hundred people were able to success hundred people came in mm -hmm. only seventy percent were able to because right. payment system didn't work because my server went down because this unbound would speak to the quality still looking at your system what's going on with painting with what I offer because that's what we guarantee success. Uh, I'll take one more. To one number of customers call in a week. Oh yeah. interesting. Time to doorbell. That's a good one. Someone's been looking at my slice. Um so uh you time to doorbell um customer like that's the inverse right customer support um okay well they need their they achieve the file. They're able to order. Did they get the pizza? Did the Uber dude just eat it? I don't know. Like, um, well, did, did they receive the right pizza? If I ordered a Hawaiian and I got like a Greek pizza, I wouldn't exactly be happy about that, right? I got something. Just customer support call comes in. I have to make another. So yeah, uh, all these are really great ideas. It really matters. What, what matters is what matters to your business. Now, how are we doing on time? And also know that we start. So are we still good? Okay. Cool. Yay, another activity. Guess what? Our pizza shop is a hit. And our customer feedback suggests that we can improve our delivery time to doorbell. So what is the well, this this is up to you. What feature are we going to introduce to reduce time uh, to doorbell or delivery time? If you really want an idea, I can give one to you. It'll be like, oh, autonomous drone delivery, just for the sake of time. But if you want to do another fun feature, go ahead. But the ask is, what additional metrics would you introduce for this additional feature to decrease time to deliver? So let's take another five minutes for this, please. Go ahead. Additional <laughs> metrics. With happiness engagement, okay. Um, so, um, it's very, very efficient. How many drones does it back that? Okay, so would that be like rage check? Like, what we've done with back, take it back. Yeah. Any, uh, anyone else? <laughs> I mean, I'm not be home. No, and that force you have in the kitchen because maybe the business, but maybe our goal could be to, uh, to reduce the amount of waste to do so we can promote some new kind of types of pizza, specific types of pizza, mm -hmm. in order to throw out the business. Right. Um, my question for that would be how does this tie in with the improvement of delivery time? Is it because of the waste? Is it the measure of waste? Right. Yeah. Mm. Got it. Okay. So, are we measuring the, re the reduced waste, or are we measuring like the improvement of time because of this? Yes. The other one now. That's one. Yeah. The waste is more faster. Sure. Okay. okay. Specific. Delivery only. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyone else? You can keep the shops. Oh, okay. So the happiness of your tipping. Yeah. Got it. If we're rolling out a new feature, we uh, thought about maybe collecting feedback on that feature specifically. There you go. Were people happy that the feature was there? Did they feel they had an improved experience? That would yeah. be like a happiness measure. So you're kind of like get, getting in there, right? Now, the tips maybe you can compare tips of autonomous drones to regular deliveries. And maybe you're like, it's a drone, why should I do it? Maybe that throws a wrench in your metric, right? I don't know. 
right? That is going to be an order density. And so Dumb. if you drove four pizzas a year and then four times trips, you ship one, right? Yep. There you go. Oh, right. So round trip potential. Something wrong round trip. Well, if, if one drone could do four stops, exactly. it would be cut down to round trip. Too. I have a question. Why would you tip a drone? There you go. Yes, it can be about your employees if it relates to value. It's like, oh no, does have the relationships and money. When he is a job, and he is a job, so like it will probably lose duration of the delay. So that is another issue. So then, interesting. So you will get post-market too, or is it only customer? Typically, they will be customer facing, but your workforce does impact your service as well as the product. So maybe it. It might be worthwhile having a metric for that. Like if your employees are not satisfied, that's going to have an adverse effect to the rest of the, your service, right? So maybe, maybe that might be a different uh, indicator. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, so consistency of order, which is you know, it's probably good that Nice. Um, anyone else? Basically, you can treat this picture the same way as you treated the online pickup shop role with metrics that we discussed in the first part. Probably 80 to 90 percent you can just use on this picture, right? It's like how many times the people are using it and all that stuff. Yep. So, yeah. Something we thought about actually, um, just to add to her, what she said was, um, um, you know, when you place your order online, you have you can have the option of a regular delivery or to use a new feature. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can use that to track like retention or even engagement yeah. reduction. See how many people opt in for that. So that's really a good point. How many of you have the new beta button on any of the apps or whatever? Like, I'm sure that you've probably seen that. Like, oh, check out our new look ahead of time before they roll it out. Right? So there's an opt-in uh, where you can measure that type of function, right? How many people are actually opting into that? Um, uh, task success, are they actually getting, how many fail deliveries uh, are there compared to, you know, uh, the standard delivery? Maybe how many customer support calls are there, right? Maybe uh, the intention was to reduce delivery time are we actually reducing delivery time? So what's the average delivery time um, in a particular radius or something like that? Those are other things that you can, um, you can measure. Now, I hope those activities are fun. They obviously just intended to have you all chat. <laughs> no one wants to just listen to me speak, so. No, but I will share my closing thoughts, okay? For me, happiness is more of a macro metric. It's useful for the the bigger picture, the products, it's a little bit less useful for features, especially if you're shipping a feature once a week, once a month. Are you going to, you know, bombard your customers with, hey, uh, what do you think about this button? What do you think about that button? What do you think about this button, right? How about this graph? Um, so the macro metric is typically done on a product or service level, I find. The other thing that I've found is that engagement can be used as a leading indicator for retention for any of you in a SaaS business running subscriptions on a year to year basis, B2B. Um, if your engagement drops off in the last three months, what's your chances of resigning that customer, right? Um, for me, when you, come, when you start measuring things, not from a full product level, but from a feature or a deliverable level, my favorite ones are adoption and task success. Are people using it? And are they doing it to achieve something that you had set out for them to achieve? So these are my personal ones. I'm gonna have a couple more uh, quotes here. This is really interesting. This comes from Lean Enterprise by Jez Humble, um, Molesky, and uh, Barry O'Reilly, I think it was. 
most good ideas actually deliver zero or negative value. 60 to 90% of ideas do not improve the metric they were intended to improve. I believe that this had come from the research of Dr. Ronnie Kohagi when he was over in charge of data mining at AWS. I believe he's at Microsoft now. These were done from the results of A-B testing. These were vetted ideas that reached their wage abroad. And it was released and they're like, oh my goodness, a lot of these things are not improving the metric we intended to improve. Can you imagine that? You mean nobody would be in Microsoft's office? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my closing thoughts is for the project, for the product or feature or software that you're building, what is the problem that you're solving? Because all of this is contextual to the thing that you're doing. Do you understand the why? Do you understand the impact it is intended to deliver? So what is the problem you're solving? What metrics make the most sense? Because no, you can't just, well, you can apply all of them, but not all of them of equal value, right? How will it impact the future of your product? How do you learn from it? How are you going to, well, going back to Scrum, inspect and adapt? How are you getting this feedback and how are you going to adapt to it? So my big point is, how are you going to now measure the success of your solution, your software, your product, and its value? And that's everything. So here's a bunch of references on the slide. Um, oh, can I do a plug for my company? <laughs> um, my company, if you want to reach me, I'm available on LinkedIn. That's my website. And uh, I work at Pay Shepherd. And uh, we're hiring for a senior uh, software developer, primarily looking for someone that will thrive in a startup world that has an active pulse on the broader tech community so that we can continue to bring in good ideas. So there you go. Thank you, Jason, so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to open it up just to maybe some a few questions, five, ten minutes. If anybody has any questions for Jason, you can use them all. <laughs> Funny you ask. Um, I was actually, uh, I, I made an quote unquote online pizza shop, but it was more like just uh, a side project so that I could use a bunch of different technologies that I have to use. Uh, yes, I am not very creative. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, all of you have your own context right now, future context you can apply this to. And basically, the message that I'm still evangelizing is I took for granted what it means. I took for granted what impact my software was making, and nothing um, makes well, at least the majority of developers I know more thrilled than to know that their stuff is being used and a lot of people love it. Right? I think that's why we're in that type of space. What does your company do now, Pay Shepherd? Pay Shepherd is a vendor relationship management. So basically, our primary customers are uh, heavy industry. And uh, the founders come from pulp and paper. And the intent is, that, like our CEO's story is he double billed a customer 250K. Went through four rounds of manual review. The only check that caught it was, I think, the final accounting check or something like that. They're like, wait a minute, we already paid this. And he's like, oh my goodness, that almost destroyed our relationship because a lot of these general contractors, they, um, their, their business thrives on the relationships, especially if they're in small communities. So he wanted to make sure that there is both transparency in the entire process and also there's a fair exchange of value. And so the whole platform, like the, the big key part of it is Based on the contracts that you're signing with this general contractor and all of their subcontractors, can you detect anomalies from uh, the contract that, like, oh, we built a thousand hours of work instead of a hundred? Like, if someone had an extra zero along the way, can we flag that? Is it compliant? If someone's like billing for 16 hours of work in a single day, you're like, that's not like safety is number one on construction sites, right? So it's like, that's like not good, especially because this guy has to travel an hour each way as well to the construction site. So um, we want to be able to have more transparency and visibility and bring value by helping save customers money, bring safety to the workforce, et cetera. So it's a platform that connects both vendors, uh, our contractors, as well as the customers that own the sites.
Um, I think I saw a hand in the back. No? Uh, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so the metric, like uh, the heart metrics, uh, um, make a lot of sense. But I'm wondering how they sort of apply to an enterprise software where like engagement, adoption, retention don't really apply so much. I think the other ones maybe do. I wonder if there's a uh, um, a set of metrics that better represents uh, um, how to represent the enterprise employee to help the employee and the government. It's important to have a good base for the person that's there. All that. But then they're useful as they want to watch the job. Are you considering like enterprise software or enterprise as like a business, like as, as an organization? Um, enterprise software, mm -hmm. the software that's developed for use in an enterprise. Sure. Right? Yeah, oh, well, I mean, uh, an example of this is retention, right? How are you measuring customer churn? And do you, like, customer churn over a long business cycle, like a year or like renewal, you want, that's a lagging indicator. Are there any leading indicators such as month over month engagement, people logging into your platform to use it? That's exactly what I used for um, when I was doing enterprise software. So that's an example. Um, adoption, we released uh, new integrations with other platforms, um, what is the adoption rate for this over time? And is it being used as expected based on the demand? Let's say sales, we got this into, we, uh, we need this integration. Cool, we did it. Five months later, no one's used it. The person that needed it for the sale, they're not using it too, right? So that's an example of enterprise. Yes? So for me, uh, all of these conversations come from door you know, a lot of folks. How would the many organizations, everyone design team, product team, everyone would play or be engaged with the customer program? Would the founders, the product people are doing that active and they sort of events the question. So, what are the reasons? So, for me, I feel maybe there are issues of even customers knowing exactly what. They think they want or what they think they need. Sometimes it's easy to see, but when you see the feature in action, then you begin to realize, oh, because I really wanted this. Mm -hmm. Now I don't. So, so we must be able to create that moment to understand that mm -hmm. customers would say they want A, B, C. Um, are we just going to take it? Mm -hmm. so what fun can we do? Helping them through that. Yep. Those things that they say. Then for me, number two is how much of involvement are we getting our developers in front of the customer? Say we call it game back, right? Mm -hmm. now, taking developers, the people that actually do the work, beyond the product manager, beyond mm -hmm. the product, I mean, that they're in, when they get in front of the customers, um, sometimes because they're the ones that build the systems. They can see the pain better, yeah. and they need to try to yeah. complement the product team. So, in summary, customers sometimes they don't know we must be prepared to add to our job to help them see these things and take the development team, the people that actually do the work, let them into the more. In the case, keeping them in the back end, only the product teams do this engagement. Um, so the, I'm going to address two points here. The second one that you're talking about, how do we build a comp the empathy to the customer? Um, there's a couple of techniques that uh, that do this. One is uh, we come from the lean space called Gamma Box. Are you walking the walk with the customer? Are you exploring their workspace? Are you experiencing what they experience? Another way that uh, Amazon had done this was Jeff Bezos was answering phone calls and so understanding what the issues were. How do you get that type of empathy? There's no better way to get that by interacting with other customers. In fact, I know that um, one of my other organizations, developers, were on the calls, right, to help them out. Um, your point about are we building what the customer wants? Is that really what they need? That is the crux of product management and user uh, research. Like, uh, there's a couple of funny stories. Um, I don't know how true they are, but uh, they're from Dan Olson's Lean Product Playbook. 
And he said back in Henry Ford's days, if you ask the person what they wanted, they just wanted a fast horse. What they really needed or wanted was how do you get somewhere more reliably faster, right? Um, the other one was the NASA space pen. Have any of you heard of that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. So basically, for those of you who have heard it, um, I think NASA spent like, I forget how many millions um, to develop a pen so that people can write in space. And uh, the story is that the Russian uh, astronauts just use a pencil. <laughs> Space Pardon? The pencil will introduce particulates. Yep, that's right. Not so good for your health. Now, not so good for your health. That it could break and you know, there could be stuff. But I guess the point is the purpose was how do you have a reliable um, writing utensil in zero gravity? And there's a lot of investment and depending on the tool for the job. And I go again back to my experience with Excel. What's your main competitor? Sometimes it is just something very rudimentary, right? So important lessons, right? Uh, listen beyond what they say to what they actually mean, right? I think just closely to the specificity. Let's give it up for Jason one more time. Thank you. Thanks everybody for uh, today, and we look forward to seeing you all again. Do you want to? No, I don't. Okay, we'll have to screen the uh, things, but if you guys uh, want to leave us uh, some feedback or just talk to one of us before you go, that'd be really helpful. And what are your heart metrics? <laughs> <laughs> we use NPS for happiness. Yeah. yeah. Definitely NPS. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming, Ryan.